All right, so welcome to the second lecture um, about variation in chromosome structure and number. We're going to cover the second half of chapter eight here with the exception of, as you can see, 8.7, which we are not going to worry about um, in this, uh, this course. And what we're going to do in this lecture is look at a couple of other ways that your chromosomes can be, um, your, your large parts of your chromosomes can be altered and what kind of effect that has on um, an organism. So at the end of the last lecture, we were talking about duplications. Uh, this part of the lecture, we're going to talk about the, so deletions and duplications change the total amount of genetic information in a cell. The stuff we're going to talk about now is, well, inversions tend to not change much at all in terms of genetic information. Um, and that's what we'll talk about now. And then we'll go on to talk about where you get whole chromosomes missing or added to the genome. So an inversion is kind of what it sounds like. It's, a, it's where you get a segment of the chromosome that flips. So you get two breaks, the DNA flips and then gets repaired. So you basically just flip over part of a chromosome. Um, so this is a normal chromosome written so that you can uh, see what order the different loci come in, A through I here in alphabetical order. When you get an inversion, it can happen in two sort of general ways. The first way is called a pericentric inversion. This type of inversion is basically an inversion that includes the centrosome. So pericentric includes the centrosome. I always used to remember that by the fact that a centrosome has an E in it, so does the first part of this word, pericentric inversion. So that you can see, um, basically there's a bit of break point uh, right outside of D and right outside of G, and that whole middle part flipped around uh, as shown here. The second type of inversion is just one that happens on one of the chromosomal arms and doesn't include the centrosome. So that's a paracentric inversion. And it's shown here. So in this inversion, you can see that we've had a break just next to B and just next to E. And then that whole part of the chromosome is flipped around. Now, as you can see, in both of these, we haven't lost or gained any genetic information at all. So the total amount of genetic information is the same. Generally speaking, there's no phenotypic consequences when this occurs. We could all be walking around with inversions, uh, a lot of us probably are, that have no phenotypic consequence whatsoever. Generally, the times when you get a phenotypic com consequence from an inversion, you get um, one of two things. The first is called a breakpoint effect, and that's kind of obvious. You break a gene in half. So if you imagine, you know, when you get an inversion, you need to break a chromosome at two different places. As you guys know, 98% of your DNA does not contain genes. So it's unlikely one of those breakpoints will happen to be right in the middle of a gene. But in rare cases when that does occur, if that gene is important, there's a phenotypic consequence because you essentially just destroy that gene. The second is a little bit more complicated. It's called position effect. We've talked before about how non-coding portions of DNA can affect the expression of a gene. So there are these things called enhancers and silencers, which are which are part of the DNA sequence that are not genes themselves, but transcription factors bind to those regions of DNA and, and either upregulate or downregulate expression, in other words, transcription of a gene. There are events where you get an inversion, and if there's a gene right at the end of the inverted region, it might get flipped around and put right next door to, for example, um, an enhancer that really upregulates the transcription of a gene that it's right next door to. The gene normally would not be next to that enhancer, so it can cause expression changes in that gene that are not normal, 
and that can actually have a phenotypic effect. But generally speaking, because inversions don't add or detract genetic information, there's normally no phenotype. Um, I said that it's probable that a lot of us are carrying around inversions. That's true. So about 2% of the human population. Um, so probably one person in our class, maybe one person in our class. Um, Harry has some kind of a big inversion that you could physically see with a light microscope. Um, weird things tend to happen if you have an inversion on one of your two chromosomes. So example, chromosome one, right? You've got two copies, one from mom, one from dad. If you inherited uh, an inversion from, say, your father, then you are what is called an inversion heterozygote because your mom's chromosome one does not contain an inversion and your dad's does. So you're heterozygous for that inversion. Now, weird things can happen um, in meiosis when the chromosomes line up for recombination if you have an inversion, and I'll show you why. This looks kind of like a nuts um, picture, but bear with me. So let's look at the one on the left first, the pericentric inversion. And if you remember what that means, it's an inversion that um, includes the centrosome. So here we have an example of two chromosomes lined up to each other um, in an individual, and the cell is going through meiosis. So crossover is going to occur. Like the other chromosomes we've looked at in this section, there are letters telling you the order of genes along this chromosome. What you see here is that the second chromosome that this person has, again, this is in metaphase of meiosis. So we've got these two sister chromatids, but these guys are lining up um, by virtue of their sequence similarity. So A lines up with A, B lines up with B, and so on and so on and so on. The issue here is that this second chromosome has an inversion. So this individual is an inversion heterozygote. So this person has D through G flipped around compared to this person. Now, when these two chromosomes line up at metaphase, because of this inversion, they line up in this super weird way. Instead of lining up next to each other in a linear fashion like this, you get the middle part of this one all twisted around so that D is lining up with D and E is lining up with E and so on and so on and so on. So you get this weird lining up simply because these guys line up by virtue of sequence similarity. Now, if you get a crossover in this part, so there's a crossover here within the inversion loop. That's what this loop is called. Uh, you could look at it and kind of work out what would happen because if you follow the purple line here, we got A, B, C, D, E, and then um, you get a crossover here you would get then F, G, C, B, A. And that's what's shown here. So A through E are normal, A through E are normal, and then there's, whoop, crossover. Now we've attached to F, G, C, B, A, F, G, C, B, A. Of course, as you guys know from crossovers, the outer two are not gonna be affected here. So if this crossover occurred, the outer two would not be affected but the inner two would. So um, the other one would of course be this blue one, which is now gonna go, oh, sorry, is it this blue one? So D, E, crossover, F, G, H, I. D, E, F, G, H, I. Uh, sorry, D, E, F, G, I see those C, B, A. Oh, it's this one, that's right. So I, H, G, and then F, 
and then it would go E D H I. Oof, that's hard. Um, so you can see both of those chromosomes are shown here, and they both carry both a deletion and a duplication because of this weird crossover. In the case of a paracentric inversion, so here's an inversion that doesn't contain the centrosome, um, you basically get slightly different things. You get one chromosome after the crossover that contains two centromeres, that's called a dicentric chromosome. The other one doesn't contain a centromere at all. This guy would be lost because there's no centromere to pull it to any cell during cell division. This guy would probably get broken apart or may get broken apart if the centromeres are pulled to the opposite poles uh, when the cell goes through cell division. So obviously this is a meiotic cell division because of the crossovers. So you're gonna get some weird gametes formed uh, in both of these cases. Translocations um, are different from inversions in that basically one part of a chromosome breaks off and becomes translocated. It moves to a different chromosome. Um, so translocations can happen in a couple of different ways. The first way is um, a balanced translocation where basically two chromosomes swap information completely. Uh, typically this is harmless because it's called, it's called a balanced translocation because of that. Uh, it's reciprocal. You're just swapping DNA between two chromosomes. Uh, sometimes, however, you can get what is called an, a simple or unbalanced translocation where part of one chromosome breaks off and just attaches to another one. This can cause diseases such as in the case of familial Downs syndrome. And I'll show you how that would happen right now. So familial Downs, so everybody knows about Down syndrome. Um, normally you think about it as a trisomy where you have three copies of chromosome 21. You should of course only have two. But in a, and that's a spontaneous event, so that's not passed on from uh, parents to kids. Familial Down syndrome, as the name suggests, runs in families. And this is a relatively low percentage of Down syndrome cases, about two to four percent. And it's kind of similar as you would expect to that other disease because it has a very similar name. This time, instead of carrying a whole extra version of chromosome 21, you carry um, a large part of it because of a translocation. And basically, this person carries what is in effect three copies of chromosome 21 and therefore shows some of the, or a lot of the, um, uh, a lot of the phenotypes that are associated with Down syndrome. Um, this is actually an example of something called a Robertsonian translocation. This is a version of, um, a version of um, a simple translocation, basically. Um, Down syndrome phenotypes include things like, so here's a picture of a Down syndrome individual. Physical growth delays oftentimes are shorter than other people. Um, very characteristic facial features, which is normally seen um, in Down syndrome and is quite recognizable. Uh, and normally mild to moderate intellectual um, disability is seen too. So let's look at familial Down syndrome and see what happens in that syndrome. So what you're looking at here is essentially um, a version of uh, an individual that has a balanced um, translocation. Uh, and if you'll excuse me for a second, I am going to um, let my kid outside and stop my uh, phone beeping. I'll be right back. Okay, kid successfully dispatched. Um, yeah, so uh, a normal genotype of somebody um, without Downs is shown on the top left here. So we have two copies of chromosome 14, two copies of chromosome 21. That's what, uh, you know, most people have. Um, this 
is an example of a parent who has um, a Robertsonian translocation. So in this particular individual, I have to pause my video again. Hold on one second. Sorry about that. Um, so as I said, top left shows you a normal genotype. Two copies of chromosome 14, two copies of chromosome 21. This person, so this is the genotype of a parent. Uh, this person has a normal phenotype, and that's because they've had the long arm of their chromosome 21 undergo a translocation to the end of chromosome 14. Now, if you look at the, the small arm, the P arm, of chromosome 14 and chromosome 21, you'll see they're very, very tiny. So this person has lost the short version of um, the short arm of chromosome 14 here, um, but it doesn't matter because it can contain any useful genetic information. And the long arm of chromosome 21 has become attached to it. Um, if you look at what this person is genetically then, they have one copy of chromosome 14. They have basically two copies of chromosome 14 because this counts as basically a whole copy. And then they have two copies of chromosome 21 because both of these, this is a full chromosome 21, and this is as much chromosome 21 as you need to be fine. So this person, despite there's only three chromosomes here, they effectively have two copies of chromosome 14 and two of chromosome 21. Now, think about what would happen when this individual makes their gametes, right? So now it gets confusing because normally, just go back to this wild type person for a minute. This is simple, right? Each gamete is going to get one copy of chromosome uh, 14 and one copy of chromosome 21. No problem. This is weird because there's only three chromosomes here. So there's some possibilities, and basically, one of the possibilities is totally normal. This chromosome 14, this chromosome 21 end up in the same gamete. It's a normal gamete. Sometimes, because there's only three chromosomes here, one of the gametes will just get one chromosome. So that's what's happening here. This gamete got just the translocated version of this chromosome. And if you think about what this gamete got, it basically got a full chromosome 21 and a full chromosome 14. So that would also be like a wild type gamete. This one is weird because it got basically one copy of 14 um, and then two copies of 21. And there's other possibilities. I'm not going to go through all of them. But um, now what we do is let's look at what happens if these got fertilized with a normal gamete from another person. That normal gamete would, of course, have one copy of 14 and one copy of 21. So on fertilization, normally you would expect to get two copies of each of those chromosomes. That's what's happening in this offspring on the left, because this was our normal gamete. We just add these two to that, and we see, hey, a normal genotype. Two copies of 14, two copies of 21. This gamete, when combined with these two would give you what is called a balanced carrier. And that's essentially the same genotype as the parent up here, right? This abnormal parent. Effectively, two copies of 21 and two copies of 14. If you combine this gamete with a normal gamete, you get what looks a lot like a typical down genotype, where you have three copies of 21 and two of 14. Now, the rest of these are all what are called unbalanced gametes in that they have, um, you're missing a whole copy of chromosome 21 here, you're missing a whole copy of chromosome 14 here, and here you would have three copies of chromosome 14. All of these are unbalanced. The amount of DNA is uh, not what you would normally have. And they are so unbalanced in terms of genetics that they're lethal. 
Um, so that's what familial Down syndrome is. You have a carrier parent who makes a gamete that happens to get fertilized by um, somebody else and you get a familial Down syndrome case. Uh, here's an example of that. So here's a child with familial Down syndrome, phenotypically look just like a, a, a regular Downs individual that has a whole extra copy of chromosome 21. And this is her carrier type. And what you can see here, it's kind of neat, is that this person has these two copies of chromosome 21. Chromosome 21 is very small. Um, and here's a normal version of chromosome 14. And if you look at the end of this version, you can see this thick band here. That's because it is one of these that has become stuck onto chromosome 14. Um, so the final part of this chapter that I want to discuss is changes in chromosome number. So now what we're talking about is not deletions, duplications, inversions. We're talking about ways in which organisms get a whole new chromosome or a whole new set of chromosomes. Um, chromosomal number can basically um, vary in two ways, one of which is um, relatively rare in animals, and that is euploidy. So a euploid organism has a variation in complete sets of chromosomes. For example, uh, me and you are diploid because we have two complete sets of our chromosomes. Certain frogs have four versions of each chromosome. So they inherit two versions of each chromosome from each parent. They are tetraploid, which just means four copies of each chromosome. Uh, so that is a euploid variation. Happens a lot more in plants than it does in animals for some reason. There are no examples of human beings that are triploid, for example. It just doesn't happen. Uh, aneuploidy, on the other hand, is very different. So aneuploidy is when you get one extra chromosome within a set. So instead of two copies of chromosome 21, you would have three. You would be an aneuploid individual. These are generally... These are regarded as abnormal conditions and lead to uh, phenotypes in, in humans. Um, and that's because, as you can imagine, there are thousands of genes on most chromosomes. If you carry an extra copy of every gene on a chromosome, you're effectively making 50% um, more of each protein than in a normal individual that just has two copies of each gene that can cause problems, especially when you're talking about hundreds or even thousands of genes. Um, so this is, just to give you an example of that, this is a normal diploid individual, two copies of each of these chromosomes. This person is a trisomic individual, meaning they are aneuploid, they have three copies, of chromosome number two here, making them trisomic. And they would have 150% of the proteins made from every gene along these chromosomes because they have a whole extra copy. Um, this is a monosomic individual, which has actually lost a whole chromosome. Um, in most cases, being trisomic or monosomic is not good for you. Monosomic individuals um, have a lot of trouble. So trisomic individuals. Um, and just as a note, um, so this is the carrier type of somebody with familial Down syndrome. And I put this up just to show you that um, the chromosomes are numbered here, one, two, three, four, five, all the way through to 22. And then here's the X and the Y. Please notice that human chromosomes in carrier types are numbered according to their size. So your number one chromosome is your biggest, and number 22 is the smallest, and then you have, of course, the X and the Y, which are separately classed. Um, when you see trisomies in humans, 
the most common one is trisomy 21. And if you notice, it's one of the smallest chromosomes. Just like duplications and deletions, the amount of genetic material matters. So you never see anybody that's a trisomy of chromosome one because there's loads of genes on chromosome one. If you have an extra copy of it, then you never make it through um, gestation to be uh, a fully formed individual. You only ever see um, trisomies of the numbers of the smaller chromosomes. Um, so Down syndrome is the most commonly known um, aneuploid condition in humans. You may or may not know this, but incidence of Down syndrome, the, the older you are when you are a woman that has a kid, um, then the more chance you have of, an, of a kid with um, Down syndrome. So when you're 20, your chances are one in 2,300. By the time you're in your late 40s, the chances are one in 50. So a huge change. And that's thought to be because um, as a female, you are born with all of the, you already have the cells that are going to become eggs already in your ovaries when you're born. Um, and once a month, one of those cells will become activated and will go on to become, you know, a potential um, a gamete that will be fertilized. Because those cells are aging in your ovaries every year, it's thought that the chance of um, a non-disjunction event goes up over time just because the cells are aging. I just said a very complicated word, non-disjunction. You don't know what that means yet, but I will tell you about it right now. So um, this is how most upwards of 90% of Down's cases occur. And basically, as makes sense, when you know that Down syndrome is um, caused by an extra version of chromosome 21, um, it's caused mechanistically by the failure of chromosomes to segregate properly during anaphase. So remember, anaphase, chromosomes are pulled apart. Um, if they do not get pulled apart, if two chromosomes go in one direction, instead of getting split, that can lead to a gamete with an extra um, chromosome. So non-disjunction is the name of that when chromosomes don't separate properly during anaphase as Mendel's law of segregation would suggest they should. Um, meiotic non-disjunction is the name for a non-disjunction event that occurs during meiosis when you make your gametes. And this can produce gametes that have either too many or too few chromosomes. One of those happens to get fertilized, then that's when you get an individual with either too few or too many chromosomes. So Down syndrome is caused by the meiotic non-disjunction of chromosome 21. How does that occur? Well, this is a schematic of meiosis. So remember that in meiosis, there are two parts to it, meiosis one, where along the metaphase plate, you separate chromosomes to make your gametes haploid. And then in, in meiosis two, the sister chromatids will get separated in anaphase right here um, to leave you with your fully formed haploid daughter cells. Non-disjunction can occur in anaphase here in meiosis one or here in meiosis two. Uh, and it will have different um, consequences depending on where it happens. Uh, so here's an example of non-disjunction in meiosis one. So what we're looking at here is anaphase of meiosis one, where we are meant to be separating the chromosome pairs. One should go one way and one should go the other way. In this case, you'll notice that both of these blue chromosomes have attached to the spindle apparatus on the left here, and both of them are going in one direction. So when this cell goes through uh, meiosis two, you're gonna separate the sister chromatids, but check it out, this one has two blue chromosomes and this one has zero. And that's gonna lead to this problem. So when you're numbering chromosomes, uh, the letter N, refers to the number of chromosomes. So for example, human beings have 23 chromosomes. So we are 23N. But we are also 
to N, we are diploid. So that means we have 46 total chromosomes separated into two sets. So if you look at what's going on down here, um, we have two chromosomes that went one way in meiosis one. Um, this led to these weird looking gametes where we have two, two of them have an extra blue chromosome, two of them are lacking a blue chromosome. If one of these gets fertilized, it produces an individual that is trisomic because it will have these two blue chromosomes plus the extra one that gets through fertilization. And these guys are going to be monosomic because they're just going to get one blue chromosome from the other parent. But notice that if um, non disjunction happens in meiosis one, then all of the gametes are abnormal. As I mentioned, it can also happen in the second cell division in meiosis, meiosis two. Um, and in this case, meiosis one happens normally. Um, but look at what's going on in this left hand cell in meiosis two. Now, instead of separating the sister chromatids, we're pulling both of them in one direction. Uh, these two gametes would be normal. These two would be unusual, giving us 50% abnormal gametes and 50% normal gametes. Um, and that's how Down syndrome occurs. In one of the parents, you get uh, a non disjunction event. So you get too many chromosomes pulled in one direction. And that happens to be the gamete that gets fertilized. Uh, and that's how you end up with a, a Downs individual. Uh, as you can see here, the, these are aneuploid conditions in humans. We just talked about trisomy 21. There's two other relatively common trisomies in humans, 13 and 18. Again, those are the smaller chromosomes. Um, there's also trisomies of sex chromosomes too there's a little bit more um a little bit more flexibility in your sex chromosomes because of x inactivation and the fact that um you can survive just fine with two or one x chromosomes uh, and so there are some interesting chromosomal disorders that just involve the sex chromosomes all right that's all i want to say today so um Enjoy your um, enjoy your uh, assignment for this uh, week, and I will see you next week with some more lectures. Please contact me if you're struggling with any of the questions or anything in these assignments. Um, I would love to help. All right, thanks for watching.